the segment talking a little bit more about the uh, the Illuminati, of course. Uh, this is, you know, again a fascinating area, and a, and a lot of people are are looking at this now, uh, researching this, and, and trying to figure out, you know, what hidden hand actually is controlling the world. And uh, what a lot of people m miss right away, uh, which is to me at least so obvious and stands out right away, is that if you actually go and look at the uh, uh, the, the founder of the Illuminati. Uh, Adam Weishaupt, it says that he uh, from the start was trained uh, as, a, as a Jesuit and, and this is to me stands out like that uh, you know that there are clear connections here again between the Illuminati and and the Jesuits but a few people have said that uh, no we actually did want to break away from the Jesuits he was uh, um, you know he, he had other ideas basically but yeah. what, what, do you, what would you say about that? Great line. That's the lie that the Jesuit the conspiratorial historians want us to believe to, se or to separate us, to separate the Illuminati from the Jesuit order. And if we believe that lie, we, we will always come to a dead end as do run. It's just like, just like uh, Himmler, um, you know, renouncing Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. Third, Heilmar mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Schacht was a 33rd degree Freemason. He was Hitler's banker. He ran the Reichsbank. He financed the building of the German war machine. Mm -hmm. Absurd to say the Third Reich was against Freemasonry. When you have these high Masons financing it and being a part of it. No. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. Wasn't it even, uh, uh, let's see now, the, the, the castle? Um, they had the, the, the castle, the Nazis, where um, the. Yeah, you know, uh, Wevelsburg, that's right, yeah. Uh, they even had, uh, I think in one of the rooms, they had the uh, uh, the big, not, not the Zodiac, but but a 12-pointed star, basically, with the relics from around uh, uh, the world, basically. And, and it seems like very much this was inspired by uh, going back to the, the Knights of the Round Table, basically. That's right. That's a, and remember, Himmler had patterned the SS after the Jesuit order. Mm -hmm. He regarded himself as the Jesuit general and his top Nazi generals as his assistants, as the Jesuit general calls his assistants. Mm -hmm. okay? And they each sat on a high back chair with their name in silver on each high back chair mm -hmm. on this huge table in this grand room at Weevilsburg. How about Skull and Bones uh, yeah, at Skull Yale Bones University? Is, yeah, started in 1832. Through the, through the by the Jesuits by way of high-level Freemasonry, bringing that into the U.S. and they started it in a Protestant seminary to make it look like all this was Protestant and not Catholic, mm -hmm. because there were still many people aware of the fact there was a Vatican conspiracy to overthrow our Protestant nation at that time. So instead of using the Catholics to do it and going by way of the papacy, they went by way of the apostate Protestants that were full of Freemasons. And okay, and I obviously uh, forgot to ask you the the, the most uh, important question about the Illuminati here. The, are, are we recording now? We are recording. Yes, that that's okay. right. All right. Okay. Um, the the most obvious question about the Illuminati is, is of course, if there actually is an order uh, still around today with this name. Do, do you know if that is the case? Well, I believe um, I believe the past uh, recordings and speakings of John Todd. I, I know that many feel he's discredited, but nonetheless, I have no doubt that he was a member of the Illuminati of the Grand Druid Council in England. Mm -hmm. And so, most assuredly, there is an Illuminati that exists, a Grand Council there, I believe, of 13. And uh, But that Illuminati Council are really the bankers for the Vatican uh, doing the bidding of the Jesuit order. And Alberto Rivera and John Todd were in agreement when they spoke to each other on this. Now, Alberto Rivera was an ex-Jesuit. John Todd was an ex-Grand Jewett. Uh, John Todd, they railroaded him into prison. I don't know if he's still there or not, but they silenced him. Mm -hmm. Alberto Rivera was killed. He was murdered. He was poisoned. Yeah, that's that seems to be the the simplest method. Just you know, just kill them off one by one, and no problem there, right? That's right. Huh. Um, w one thing also that that I've been intrigued by uh, when when studying history, and and again considering that we're in Sweden here, um, going back to World War Two. One thing that puzzles me very much is is why Sweden actually is, seems to be one country that, you know, that that never was in, invaded uh, during the Second World War. And this is something that that I've been pondering upon what, what the what the reason for this might be, and if we consider what we were talking about earlier with the varying connections with with the with the Nazis and and uh, you know what has been going on, uh, also of course consequently with the Cold War and all this, but. Um, 
Do you have any idea why, why Sweden was spared, as it were, during World War II? Yes, Sweden, like Portugal and Spain, were to remain neutral during World War II, and that was planned that way. The Nazis needed Swedish steel, okay. mm -hmm. and uh, so Sweden was very important for that economy, and so it remained neutral during the war, and also there was atomic uh, development research and development going on in Sweden on behalf of the Nazis. Mm -hmm, the Germans. Mm -hmm. Remembering, of course, that the Americans and the Germans and the Nazis, they were all working together, together the Japanese, in atomic development. Mm, yeah. We're not enemies at the top. We have to remember that during World War II, at the top, Hirohito, FDR, Stalin, Hitler, Churchill, Franco, Mussolini, they all worked together. Mm. The king of Sweden, they all worked together. It was the delusion of putting it on the people that we have two opposing facts when there was, in fact, no such thing. Okay, so Sweden. What happens in Sweden? Well, I'll tell you this, that at the end of the war, Heinrich Himmler wasn't murdered. He wasn't killed by the British. Mm -hmm. There's a book called uh, SS1, mm -hmm. The Unlikely Death of Heinrich Himmler. And it was put out just a couple of years ago mm -hmm. by uh, Hugh, I forget his last name. But in that book, he shows that the pictures taken of Himmler by the British were obviously not Heinrich Himmler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I cover this in my third edition. Mm -hmm. Heinrich Himmler was working with the uh, Count Bernadotte oh, of Sweden yeah. uh, before the end of the war, uh, negotiating his escape through Schellenberg. Mm -hmm. and Schellenberg was uh, a powerful Nazi general of the Foreign Service. Okay, mm -hmm. So... It is absolutely, in my mind, settled that the, high, the king of Sweden with Count Bernadette orchestrated and enabled Himmler to escape out of Europe. Mm -hmm. And he probably died in Sweden. Oh, really? Yes. Sheesh. And, of, uh, of, of course, of. the Jesuits ran the Red Cross. Uh -huh. so the Red Cross, openly pretending to do good, was secretly helping to secure all these Nazis out of Europe. <laughs> and this, some of this is covered in Loftus's work, Unholy Trinity, where it talks about the Vatican rat lines. But... Sweden was used to this end, and it's very intriguing that some of the Jews that had escaped the Holocaust and they became Israelis in 1948, they knew Bernadette was a traitor. Really? So they killed him. Hmm. Count Bernadette was killed outside of Jerusalem, I believe, in 1948. 1948. Because certain hmm. of these patriotic Jews who wanted their land back knew that he had helped Himmler escape. Really? Jeez, I gotta, yeah, I gotta do more research on this. This sounds very interesting indeed. Con hmm. Connect the Bernadette, hmm. King of Sweden, Himmler, Schellenberg connection. Work wow. on that, and you'll see it all plays out. Wow, very interesting. You know, yeah, exactly, because what you say about the uh, the iron ore again is, uh, you know, very correct, and and uh, we even have a big company or had um, in in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden called uh, SKF. Uh, and it was a was a bull bearing company that basically supplied uh, you know both sides during the second world war and and this among many other things of course but but m these kinds of things i guess were uh, part of the fact that sweden wasn't you know invaded they we they needed the the workforce of of uh, all the swedes you know supplying both sides uh, <laughs> of the war with machinery and iron ore and all of this i guess so. Mm. So we see that these wars are negotiated. These wars are planned business ventures for the benefit of the men at the top who serve the Vatican for a couple of purposes. One of them is to kill heretics and liberals. Mm. Now, you know, they not only killed 6.8 million Jews in Europe, in Eurasia at this time, they also killed ten, tens of millions of German Lutherans See, that one of the purposes for the war was to destroy all the Protestants in Prussia. Mm -hmm. That's why Hitler deliberately sacrificed his sixth army and two other armies, ultimately on the Eastern Front, when they could have easily taken Stalin, they could have easily executed that trait, that Jesuit, mm -hmm. and the Russian people would have delighted to help the German army come in to overthrow Stalin because they'd only been tortured by him for what... Uh, you know, in excess of 20 years. Mm, yeah, yeah. And the Ukrainians, they welcome the Nazis into the Ukraine. But what happens? Bormann issues the order. Bormann was a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. Bormann was Hitler's Henry Kissinger. Bormann issues the order to his German army, to his SS, to be brutal to the Ukrainians. 
Hmm. And so what does that do? It drives the Ukrainians into the arms of Stalin. Hmm. Hmm. So it was obviously done to kill certain populations. And so the Protestant Prussian armies, which primarily were the armies in the East, they're all sacrificed yeah, exactly. and deliberately massacred, betrayed by Hitler. And Reinhard Gillen, who was also a Roman Catholic, he was the one in charge of all the intelligence in the East, and he later was given one of the, the highest award that the Knights of Malta could give. Hmm. Gillen was a Knight of Malta. He later is, during the Cold War, he sets up the BND. And the Jesuit that oversaw Reinhard Gellin when he set up his BND in Pollock was the Jesuit Karl Radner, mm -hmm. R-A-H-N-E-R. Radner was stationed in Pollock right with Gellin. Hmm. So after they destroyed Protestant Prussia in 1946, because remember the Jesuits that wanted to destroy Protestant Prussia since, since uh, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, mm -hmm. and they failed in World War II, Failed in World War One, but then they succeeded in World War Two, thanks to the help of the Americans and the British. Hmm. So they could mass bomb the Prussians. Remember, because lots of the mass bombing took place primarily in northern Germany, in the historic Protestant areas of Germany, oh, like Hamburg, in, like Dresden uh, and Mecklenburg, mm -hmm. uh, and Protestant Prussia. They they firebombed Dresden in the name of Christ. It yeah. wasn't even a military target. Yeah, yeah. The, the British bombed it uh, in the day, and the Americans bombed it at night, I believe. A four-mile four uh, firestorm engulfed Dresden and killed, it's estimated, a million people. And it wasn't even a military target. It was the most beautiful Protestant city in all of Prussia. Hmm. It was a war against Protestantism. And so what is, and that was payback for Goering, who was an apostate Protestant and was used by the Jesuits. And what does Goering do? He bombs Coventry. <laughs> What's Coventry? Eng Coventry was a Protestant city. and one of the most beautiful Anglican cathedrals in all of England. Mm -hmm. They firebombed, they, they bombed it to smithereens. So they bombed Protestant Coventry, they bombed Protestant Dresden. So they carried out the destruction of the Reformation using both armies pretending to fight against one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now they did bomb Munich. They killed 250,000 people in Catholic Munich, but Remember, Munich refused to accept the infallibility of the Pope, and you have a great Roman Catholic priest out of Bavaria, Munich there, whose, whose name was Ignace von Doliger, who refused to accept the temporal power or the uh, infallibility of the Pope, challenged anybody to a debate. He was defrocked, he was excommunicated, and the Bavarian people refused to accept the infallibility of the Pope, and they wanted their own nation. In fact, Bavaria did not want to be part of the German Reich, and Hitler shoved that Reich down their throats. Mm. So these German Catholics were regarded as German Catholic liberals, and they too were condemned. Mm. So they too must be firebombed. They too must be bombed by the Americans. So they, uh, they took every chance they had here during, because again, this time was so... Uh, well, apocalyptic to say the least. I mean, <laughs> the whole world is in war here, basically. So this, they took this opportunity, as it were, to actually, uh, you know, blow up as many places as possible and in a almost mass, you know, ritual sacrifice thing, uh, kill as many people as possible. That's right. Let's look at, for example, the German invasion of Russia. Now, the Russian people, they weren't communists. Only 1% of that population was communist. The Communist Party ruled Russia. And how did it rule Russia? It ruled it through the NKVD. The NKVD was run by Jesuits, mm -hmm. using certain open Jews to make it look like the Jews ran the NKVD. But the general of the NKVD, NKVD was a general by the name of Nikolai Vlasic. Nikolai Vlasic was a Gentile, a Russian, and he was the... Uh, overseer of the NKVD when the NKVD and the Gestapo worked together after they had divided Poland mm -hmm. to kill 15,000 Polish Roman Catholic true nationalists, shooting them in the back of the head in the forest of Katyn near Smolsk in Russia, and, and putting them in mass graves. I show in my book that the Gestapo and the NKVD worked together. The Gestapo was under Jesuit Hitler. The NKVD was under Jesuit Berea or Jesuit Vlasic. Mm -hmm. So they both were working together for the elimination of patriotic Roman Catholic Poles who could have truly been a fight against the Russians. Mm. This is why they killed uh, Sikorsky. 
General Zakorsky. Mm-hmm. General Zakorsky heard of this, heard of this massacre of his own men, and he demanded to know if Stalin did this. Mm-hmm. And because of his pers- persistent demand that Stalin was behind this, Churchill uh, and his British SIS had Zakorsky killed. His aircraft went down in, in, the, in the sea, I believe, when it took off from Gibraltar, and that was the end of General Zakorsky and the end of all real resistance to Soviet Russia being on the hand side of the Allies. Hmm. So I cover in my book the assassination of these key generals like Zakorsky, mm-hmm. like a Japanese General Yamamoto, mm-hmm. like a American General George Patton, like German General Rommel, like French Admiral Jean Darlin. I show how uh, all these great generals were murdered because they were not playing ball hmm. by, uh, by betraying their own people and doing what they were told from the top. Mm. They had their own ideas, I guess. They wanted their own country to win. Mm. Rommel didn't want to see Germany destroyed. Rommel was a Protestant. Mm-hmm. Rommel was the one that said, this issue with the Jews has to stop. Rommel was the one who wanted all his troops there at Normandy. He knew they were going to attack Normandy. What did they do? They removed him. Hmm. And so Rommel then is sent back to Berlin, and he's told to commit suicide, or else we're going to kill your family. Hmm. So Rommel was murdered. Rommel was a great German patriot and a great German soldier, and he had respect among his enemies. When the, when the, the Italians, I believe, were stealing from the British POWs in North Africa, Rommel made them give everything they stole back to the British. Mm-hmm. Really? He was chivalrous, that's right. So we have, the, and Patton, Patton uh, knew very good and well that, the, that Russia would be a threat to us, so he wanted to invade Russia. Russia was the Jesuits' uh, kindergarten to build this huge military war machine to ultimately be used against America. So Patton cannot be allowed to live, so what happens? Mm-hmm. The, uh, the OSS are, uh, is behind a wreck. He's put into the hospital, and he's given an injection of cyanide. Hmm. according to a former OSS officer by the name of Bezata, and I quote him in my book. So all, so these key hmm. military men were murdered by the intelligence community that the Jesuits control. Hmm. I show in my book that the Jesuits control the international intelligence community, which was being built and perfected during World War II, which is British Secret Service, the Russian KGB, the American CIA, the Israeli Mossad, uh, the Canadian SIS, the German BND, they're all working together at the top, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. carrying out their various murders and assassinations, keeping the politicians in line. Any agents get out of hand, like this recent Russian agent who was killed in England? Uh, Litvinenko or... Litvinenko, they mm-hmm. murdered him. Mm-hmm, the British mm-hmm. SIS killed him mm-hmm. in conjunction with the FSB, the Soviet FSB. Mm-hmm. So, so they're all working together to neutralize anybody that can bring evidence against them. Beyond the fact that, that we can, uh, so to speak, uh, see what the fruits of, of their uh, labor or work actually is, and we can ourselves connect the dots with That's right. w- where this actually is going. But, but my question is, is there any like uh, clear I mean, evidence, I mean, for, for those who uh, want to read about this, that, that the CIA in that regard or, or that the uh, KGB or that the Mossad actually are working at, at top levels, is there documentation? I have it in my book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have it in my book. I, sh- I show you, for example, mm-hmm. the collusion between the OSS, the NKVD, and British MI6 during World War II. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, at the end of World War II, even, even after uh, uh, Potsdam. And all of a sudden, in 1946, ipso facto, there's a Cold War. All of a sudden, Russia becomes a huge enemy of the West. I remind the listeners, Russia is in shambles. They've just lost 20 million of their best people. Mm-hmm. All the churches have been destroyed. They've, they've destroyed, I think, some 6,000 hospitals. There's no infrastructure in Russia. Nothing. They cannot even grow their own food. Hmm. You mean to tell me that Soviet Russia is an is a real enemy of America, mm-hmm. the greatest uh, colossus of economic might in the world, and top in all technology? How absurd! It's an insult to the thinking of any man. 
Well, that's right. I mean, we have no idea that they actually, oh, sheesh, this is, I'm sure. laughing here. But, so what happened? Mm. Oh, no. Well, after mm. the Cold War, after World War II, what does America do? It builds Russia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One thing after another, after another, sends them green technology. Give Stalin, give Stalin the nuclear device. And this is documented in one of Roosevelt's son's books. Really? And so uh, the American government, controlled by the Vatican through the CFR, gave Stalin the nuclear device so he could detonate it. And then all of a sudden, Russia could be a great threat. Mm -hmm. And now we're, in, well, now we're going to be afraid of airborne nuclear war. So we have to let the Russians and the, uh, the Soviets carry out their inquisition yeah. against all the Eastern European peoples, killing millions of people. And remember, the Germans, uh, they sent hundreds of thousands of Lutheran Germans off to Siberia during, world, during the Cold War, mm -hmm. when we mm. could have stopped that immediately. Mm. One letter to the Pope, you either stop this or we're going to send, send our ships to the Rome. Mm. We're going to bomb the Vatican. So you stop persecuting all those German Lutherans. You stop sending all those patriotic Roman Catholic Hungarians to Siberia like in 1956. The story of 1956 is that the CIA, headed by Knight of Malta, Alan Dulles, whose brother, Knight of Malta, John Foster Dulles, was the pen holder for Eisenhower, that traitor, mm -hmm. who killed approximately two million Germans after World War II in his concentration camps. So what happens is uh, Alan Dulles uh, incites the insurrection in Hungary, in Roman Catholic Hungary, so that the people will want to throw off a Soviet occupation. And what happens at the last minute? Why, the CIA betrays all these Hungarian patriots into the hands of the KGB and the GRU so that they can be taken off, killed or tortured in Siberia, further cementing the grip of Russia, of the USSR on Hungary. The same thing is done in Czechoslovakia in 1968 with Dubec. Mm -hmm. They want to throw off the, sh the chains of Russia. The, OS, the CIA betrays them, and they get to go off to Siberia. Mm. The same thing is done in Cuba in 1961 when all the Cuban patriots want to invade and overthrow Castro, who's been trained by Jesuits for seven years. He is a Jesuit put in power by the CIA. And what happens is they're incited to invade, and oh, at the last minute... Uh, that evil skull and bonesman, uh, uh, McGeorge Bundy, cancels the order, cancels the air cover, and all those patriotic Cubans are betrayed, solidifying the rule of Castro. This is called setting up uh, the same thing is done with the Contras in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. They set them up, yeah. they finance them, the Knights of Malta are all behind, behind them, all to be sacrificed to the Sandinistas. Mm. This is called... Create, this is called bringing out the real resistance to your tyranny that you've established, telling them you're going to help them overthrow that tyranny, and then at the final hour, betraying them into the hands of their enemies, who are in fact your friends that you set up in power. Modern example, Al-Qaeda? Absolutely. Al-Qaeda is the creation of the CIA. There is no Al-Qaeda or, or bin Laden without the CIA. And of course, bin Laden, the family of the bin Ladens were in business with the Bush family for 25 years. That's right. It was a Carlisle group. Mm -hmm. And so they create this, this false enemy of Al-Qaeda when it's really nothing more than CIA-controlled Muslims to then blame this Al-Qaeda for the bringing down of the World Trade Center, which was done by George, George W. Bush, overseen by Knight of Malta, George J. Tenet, CIA, DCI director, And George J. Tenet's master is Edward Cardinal Egan of New York City, and they, he is overseen by the Jesuits at Fordham University. Mm -hmm. Remember, every archbishop is overseen by a Jesuit university or provincial nearby. Hmm. And so now this is blamed on al-Qaeda. Now we get to justify a war into Afghanistan mm, yeah. and ultimately Iraq because the end game of this war in Iraq Iran, uh, end game, the end game of this war in Iraq, one mm, of them is mm. the rebuilding of the ancient treasure commercial city of Babylon. Yeah, that's, that's right. But uh, it, some people said that, uh, to some extent, that Saddam actually was, was doing him, that himself. But I guess <laughs> since he was, again, business partnered with, with the U.S. way back that's when. That's right. Um, the same was, remember, we, let's look at Iraq for a second. Mm. Iraq um, <coughs> did not persecute certain gospel preaching missionaries. They didn't persecute them. The Jesuits came in and they started the University of Baghdad, I believe out of the Maryland province here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And what happens? 
the Jesuits are accused of meddling in the politics of Iraq. And so what does the Shiite leadership do? It expels the Jesuits from Iraq in 1969. Well, when you expel the Jesuits from your country, you can expect to be invaded. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and that is what they did. They set up Saddam Hussein as their dictator. Mm -hmm. He tortured and killed hundreds of thousands of them, who were probably true patriots and nationalists. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the Bible teaches nationalism. A nation is a race, a language, and a culture of people with geographic borders. That is what a nation is. Mm -hmm. That's why the United States is not a nation. It's a compendium of about 100 nations. That's why we cannot stand. And so when, this, when Iraq did this, they were on the hit list. And then after Saddam Hussein did his work, why well, then they simply removed him. They, they captured a double. Mm -hmm. They killed his double. And uh, Saddam Hussein's probably on the French Riviera sipping wine right about now. <laughs> you think so? And uh, Iraq is going through hell. Yeah, yeah, but, that's right. But, but, and, and this, by the way, this is a turkey shoot. It's estimated that a million Iraqis now have been killed mm, yeah. by the American occupiers. Mm. Okay? And this is a war of annihilation for the purpose of ultimately, after this, um, building Babylon on the Euphrates River, at the beginning of which is the building of Dubai, of which no Jew is allowed to even visit. So, yeah, because I've seen a few photographs. There are not that many. There might be... A lot of them on the web. I haven't uh, seen them all, certainly, but uh, of, of some uh, some areas now in in Iraq actually are uh, almost cornered off with giant walls, and uh, behind the walls are they're building up these well beautifully uh, you know architecture with beautiful buildings in some areas at least that where the main you know fighting isn't still going on. Um, and th this is interesting again because this then does give us the hint or the idea that uh, many people at the top are they're they're well rehearsed as it were in in, in the bible and they're their way into the even the mythologies of the ancient world to some extent because they're rebuilding these you know ancient empires again that's correct and the bible teaches that babylon will be rebuilt we see it in jeremiah 51 we see it in revelation 18 Babylon of Revelation 17 is a Roman Catholic institution. The Babylon of Revelation 18 is the extension of the Roman Catholic institution into commercial Babylon that they establish on the Euphrates River, most assuredly. Hmm. So yes, that's what they're doing. And that's one of the major purposes for this war, to weaken and destroy the West, while at the same time uh, building, rebuilding Babylon in the East, Mm -hmm. And uh, completely reconstituting the Muslim area so that it can be a pro it can be an assistancy for the Jesuit order because at this time it is not an assistancy. The Jesuits have divided the world into ten assistancies, and I believe this will be their eleventh assistancy. Okay, mm, good. does this in any way go back to the what is it the ten horned uh, <laughs> the the, the right. beast? Is, is this? Yeah, I believe the ten horns are the ten kings of Europe mm -hmm. that will give their power to the risen pope for the purpose that he's been determined to uh, rule the world for 42 months. And, of course, the risen pope, when he comes back to life, he's going to destroy the Roman Catholic institution. He's going to burn it with fire. Mm -hmm. And then he himself will demand all worship and all centralization of power. And as, as any, from that time, he goes down into Jerusalem and demands to be worshipped as God, pursuant to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 12, and Matthew 24. The, uh, the current pope... Uh Ratzinger, uh, what what is his chosen name? Burn, uh, what what name did he pick? Uh, no, again, I can't remember. Benedict uh, the sixteenth. Benedict, that's right, the sixteenth. Uh, uh, he's he's quite an uh, an, an old guy to, uh, today, and there even has been some uh, some rumors that there uh, you know aren't that many popes left or whatever. But uh, do you think that? I mean, in regards to to this guy, I mean, he had some history in in uh, in the SS, I think, as a as a little boy. And he sought to end the CIA, which the CIA at the top was a continuation of the SS, ran by the Knights of Malta. And the head of the CIA in the days of Kennedy, after Dulles was relieved of his command, who was a 33rd degree Freemason, mm -hmm. the head after him was John McCone, who was a Knight of Malta. Today, the head of the CIA is George Tenet, another knight of Malta with Anthony Zini, one of the big drug traders carrying on the Black Pope's international drug trade. George Tenet 
and his CIA brought down the World Trade Center with internal implosions, just as our CIA killed Kennedy under McCohn. The man who's the head of the Knights of Malta in the United States is the most powerful archbishop, and that is the Archbishop of New York. In Kennedy's day, it was Spellman. In our day, it is Edward Cardinal Egan. That is the man who is responsible for this world trade fiasco and the Pentagon fiasco, and ultimately this war. And that's why they created the high, they created this terrible scandal in the Catholic Church, which I have no doubt that this pedophilia and homosexuality has been going on for years. But the Jesuit press deliberately brought this out so that they could get the 13 cardinals back to Rome behind the secret walls of the Vatican to have a war council. They're not reforming anything. This is a council of war as to how they're going to proceed against us. And those 13 cardinals are the most powerful individual men in this country. So they sacrifice a few priests. They right. throw a little mud around. Right. Okay. Now, they've and one of the, most, can, the council, they've had it. They've had it. It took two days, and they're back. And one of the most powerful cardinals who went there is Cardinal Avery Dulles of Fordham University, who's a Jesuit, whose father, who's, who's pardon me, whose uncle, was Alan Dulles, the former head of the CIA. Hmm. The Dulles Avery board. Dulles is a very powerful man. The Dulles family continues to be uh, a powerhouse. Interesting. The Dulles boys. CFR. Dulles was uh, very much involved in CFR. The CFR is the uh, Jesuit general's secret government over the American government. is orchestrated through the Archbishop of New York. The St. Patrick's Cathedral from that palace from where the Archbishop rules is across the street from Rockefeller Center. Palace. Interesting concept. Yes, what was it about John, John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy that... It didn't mesh with the, the Jesuits and, and this whole thing. Well, Kennedy would be considered a liberal Roman Catholic. And pursuant to the Jesuit oath, they put to death Protestants and liberal Catholics. That's why during World War II, the Jesuits used their SS to kill some 2,500 Catholic priests because they were against the Nazis. So they eliminated them in Dachau and a few of the other camps. Mm -hmm. They killed their own liberals. So they did the same thing to John Kennedy when he sought to end the Vietnam War. He sought to uh, end the CIA. He also was against the Cardinal's voucher system of using tax money to support Catholic schools. Kennedy wasn't going to do that. Uh -huh. He was against the Federal Reserve System, which is run by the Jesuit order through the Knights of Malta because the stock A class holders are banks like Citibank, Morgan Guarantee Loan and Trust. They're all run by the Knights of Malta. One of them was Francis X. Stankard, who was head of Chase Manhattan Bank, who who uh, sent John J. McCloy to be on the Warren Commission. And McCloy was one of the Secretary of War under FDR who refused to bomb the railroad tracks to Auschwitz. Now, not one of the uh, labor camps, work camps, or death camps was ever interdicted with a single bombing raid that we know of. Isn't that interesting? No. And that's why I show in my book that the entire, all the intelligence agencies, the SS, the OSS, the NKVD, the British SIS, they all work together. They all dovetailed in the Vatican. Who was supposed to win World War II? Was Hitler supposed to win oh, or no. was communism supposed to win? Russia was to win, not Hitler. But the purpose of Hitler, he was to destroy the Protestant Reformation in Germany, which he succeeded in doing. The Protestantism ended for the most part. Yeah, if, his, if his scientists had come up with a... The atomic bomb first, the war might have ended much differently. Well, true. Um, they did make some calculation errors, I understand, and they just didn't get it done, but uh, they were certainly trying. You no, know, the Jesuits ran the intelligence of the, of the Third Reich. Why That's didn't well, Okay, the, all right. Uh, why didn't Adolf Hitler cross the channel and neutralize England when he had the opportunity? Wonderful question, because he was not allowed to. And any one of his generals that wanted to, to stop, for example, the landing on, on uh, Normandy, particularly Rommel, was brought back to Germany and executed because Rommel knew they were coming at Normandy. Why did Hitler give the order for the Germans to stop at Dunkirk and not annihilate 350,000 English? Mm -hmm. Because that war had to continue, and there were more Jews to kill in the East. They hadn't purged Europe of its Jews yet. Zionist involvement in World War II, we'll talk about that with Eric John Phelps and get his views on uh, one of the most controversial aspects of uh, our times as we continue after the top of the hour. Vatican Assassins is the book. Uh, it is a very controversial publication, as you're hearing. 
And the website is vaticanassassins.org. See you in a few. Eric John Phelps is my guest. His book, Vatican Assassins. He'll be speaking at the Conspiracy Conference in Santa Clara, California, May 25 and 26. And you can go to the uh, the website conspiracycon.com and pick up all the information if you're online. If you want to call and ask questions about tickets and so forth, 209-832-0999. Eric's book, Vatican Assassins, not available in major bookstores can be ordered 877-TOLL-FREE, 877-280-2866, 877-280-2866, Vatican Assassins. It is a big book packed with information. Agree or disagree with Eric's conclusions, the research in the book is staggering. Uh, he does name names, as uh, as you've heard. The Knights of Malta and other so-called fraternal organizations. Are most all of them tied into the, the papacy and the Catholic Church and the Jesuits at some point? Yes. At the leadership, at the pinnacle of power, they're all tied into the Jesuit order and subordinate to the Jesuit general. Because the Jesuit general controls the Pope, he's controlled the papacy since 1814, since the order was revived by mm. Pius VII, and from then on he has controlled all of it, including in fact, Freemasonry as well. Freemasonry, throw that in too. Does it matter who is the Pope? Does it matter that we're going to have a new Pope next time? No, not at all. All that matters is that that Pope does what the Jesuit general tells him to do. And if he doesn't do that, then he'll be punished like Pius IX when he was driven from Rome to Gaeta, or he'll be murdered like Pope John Paul I was. There have been more than a few Popes removed, I understand. Many of them. Pope Clement XIII, when he was about to suppress the Jesuits in what, 17, what was 1770, he was poisoned the night before he was going to sign the suppression. Hmm. And then when Clement XIV came to power, he was a Franciscan Ganglinelli. He then entered into a four-year investigation of the order, and after four years of investigating, suppressed the order at 1.30 in the morning while they were still in bed. But he said, this suppression will be my death, and sure enough, 18 months later, 14 months later, he was poisoned with a keta. Why was the Pope immediately before this one removed so quickly? Well, <laughs> if, if that in fact is what happened. Well, according to Abraham Manhattan in his book, Death in the Vatican, he says that this Pope, the Pope John Paul I, was poisoned. And David Yellow's book, In God's Name, said absolutely he was murdered, and he was murdered by a couple of Freemasons. One of them was Jean Cardinal Valet of France. Hmm. So. Uh, he was removed because, as I understand it, he sought to remove Pedro Arupi from the position of being Jesuit general, and that he also sought to extend diplomatic relations to Zionist Israel prematurely. Wow. All right. World War II and Zionists. There have been several books written about the idea that, and again, there's a confusion here between Jews and Zionists, but that there was a big sacrifice in World War II. Uh, and it would seem from what you're saying that the case on the basis of your research could be made, that the Absolutely. Zionists were involved. Sure. According to one book I was just recently reading at the library, the author said there, and he was a Jewish individual, said that the, the roundups of the Jews in Berlin was accomplished by the Jewish police working for the SS. Mm -hmm. Um According, That's not the only story like that I've heard, by the way. There have been many right. others. Well, we have Rudolf Kastner in, in Hungary, who sent 476,000 Jews to Auschwitz, mm -hmm. only saved 1,600 of them, mm -hmm. for which later he was, this crime was brought up when he went to Israel, and the good doctor just managed to get shot by a former agent of the Mossad before he could be tried. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, the, the high-level Zionists are Freemasons, and they're subject to the Jesuits. When did they... Bidding. When, when did the Zionists hijack Israel and the Jewish dream? They, they, they've controlled it from the beginning. David Ben-Gurion was working for the papacy. So James Wiseman was absolutely the agent of the Pope. They never, ever renounced Pius XII, who it was common knowledge was behind the SS. He had a conquer that with Hitler. He knew all about the concentration camps in Poland. Yet not one Zionist ever denounced or renounced Pius XII for his crimes. And if they would have been truly patriotic Jewish people wanting to have in their own country, don't you think they would have? There are 
of course, many stories about Jews who were very active in the communist Bolshevik revolution and subsequent decades in the old Soviet Union. Were these Jews or were they Zionists? They were, they were racially Jews and Zionists by political belief, and the Jesuits used their Masonic Jewish Zionists as the front men for their Bolshevik revolution. Mm -hmm. Lenin was partly Jewish. Stalin, his name, Dublavishi, means son of a Jew. Um, so they used uh, many, many upfront Jews to carry out their inquisition in Russia, but the Jesuits controlled the Bolshevik Revolution mm -hmm. through certain Jesuits like Bishop Rop. What does your research show in terms of who financed the Bolsheviks and the Bolshevik the whole revolution there? Well, we know that Jacob Schiff was a Masonic Jewish Zionist. He financed it from New York. But we also know it was financed by the Federal Reserve Bank and 120 Broad Street, which was that whole cartel of super capitalists there financing the Bolshevik Revolution for at least $1 million or more. Oh, at least. So, it was, I, I think it was more than that. But uh, Jacob Schiff's uh, name came up recently. Uh, Al Gore's daughter married Jacob Schiff's grandson, I believe. I see. Well, Al Gore is definitely tied to the Masonic Jewish Zionists, not only through the shifts then, if you, that's who he married, but also through Armand Hammer. Mm -hmm. Armand Hammer had free ingress and outgo all throughout oh, yeah. the communist empire from sure. the days of Lenin to the days of Gorbachev. Uh, Armand Hammer was the exclusive agent for Ford Motor Company to bring in Fords and tractors. Mm -hmm. He handled all the business there. But what we're not told is that when he built his Hammer House and that international trademark there in Moscow, mm -hmm. guess who financed it? Mm -hmm. The Bank of America, the mm -hmm. Jesuits Bank of America. A.P. Giannini, uh, former right. head of the Bank of America. Right. Okay, it's, uh, talk about a tangled web indeed. It, uh, it's amazing. But when you get to the perspective that Eric John Phelps has, it begins to look very cohesive and coherent. Okay, let's might, go. Uh, go ahead. I have one more thing if I can, Jeff. Yeah, sure. The Bolshevik Revolution was made deliberately to look Jewish so that they could raise up Adolf Hitler and the fascists in Western Europe to have this huge crusade into, into Russia called Operation Barbarossa uh -huh, for the uh -huh. purpose of killing all the Jews in Western Russia with the Einstein group and also murdering many Orthodox people who wouldn't convert to Catholicism. The the Jesuit, true, go ahead. The Jesuits were in the wake of the Einstein group and mm -hmm. were in charge of that, all four groups. Will we ever find out the uh, even one-tenth of the true involvement of the uh, the Church of Rome in, in World War II. It's, it's one of the, it seems to be one of the most closely guarded secrets of them all. It's a very closely guarded secret, but there have been several authors that have written quite a bit on it. Edmund Parrish wrote The Secret History of the Jesuits. He also wrote The Vatican Against Europe. It was released in 1965-64. We have the works of Admiral Manhattan with... Uh, the Vatican-Moscow alliance and the, the Vatican and world politics. Mm -hmm. He was a very prolific writer. There are several excellent writers who have revealed these things. Wow. All right. Okay, let's go back uh, a little bit and talk more about the Jesuits. Now, the most powerful man on the planet, in your estimation, is the so-called Black Pope. Right. Peter Hans, Hans Kolvenbach. All right. Peter, Peter Hans, Hans Kolvenbach. 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 Tell us about Mr. Kolvenbach. Kolvenbach. Mr. Kolvenbach is, of course, the Jesuit general. He commands his staff, which consists of his assistants, seven or eight of them. Now, one of them is his confessor. Another one is his advisor. And then he actually, is, no, excuse me. Does he actually have a confessor in the traditional well, yes. sense of the term? Well, yes. It's just kind of his advisor, confessor to keep his conscience in order. Huh. Um, yes, he has a confessor. He has kind of like a kind of like a commissar in house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He has an advisor, and then he has his assistants that are over various continents. And then underneath those assistants are the provincials. The provincials report to their assistant. The assistants report then to the Jesuit general, and that's how they keep tabs on all the intelligence and what's going on in all the nations of the world. The Jesuit, this particular Jesuit general, speaks eight languages one of them being Arabic, another being Hebrew, I believe. He was stationed in the Middle East for 17 years, and he's the perfect man to coordinate this war. So he's, this keeps a pretty low profile, doesn't he? Very low profile, because that's part of the secrets, that's one of the secrets of being successful. Mm -hmm. Where is he headquartered in New York? 
You know, he's headquartered uh, right outside of the walls of the Vatican. He's within the Vatican City proper. He's right outside the walls of the Vatican. He's called the head of the Jesuit Curia or Borgo di Santo Spirito, the village of the Holy Spirit. I thought there was an agency in New York that. Uh, I'm not sure a, there's a, a not a high profile in thing, but all right. Okay, very good. Uh, Peter Hans Kolvenbach, the Black Pope. Eric John Phelps is my guest. His book, The Vatican Assassins, 877-280-2866. Be right back. Okay, I'm right back with Eric John Phelps. Eric, there is a, a story running around that has been uh, in the shadows for years. I heard about it a long time ago. It has to do with the... Uh, the Ashkenazic invasion and the Ashkenazi, so-called so Ashkenazi Jews or the, the Khazars. Uh, I got a nice email from a gentleman who has written up a one-page history. Uh, Bob Taft wrote it. And I, let me just read the first part of it and see how it fits with your research. This is from Bob Taft. I'll just quote it here. It is often suggested that there were no Palestinians to speak of in Palestine, when the Rothschilds bankrolled the Ashkenazic invasion and occupation led by Irgun and the Stern Gang in 1948 to create a trouble spot for future political capitalization. In fact, there were close to a million Muslim and Christian Arab people forced from their homeland of 1,300 years in the crowded refugee camps in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and the Gaza Strip. In caves in Palestine, squatters rose near larger Arab cities, and the slums of the cities themselves where they barely existed for years afterward. The fact was, these people, called Jews, a word that came into use around the time of the King James Bible, aside from their adoption of a religious belief system that had once been prevalent in the area, had absolutely no business being there. They were not Semitic, but were of Turkic Mongol extraction, descendants of the people of the ancient kingdom of Khazaria, who adopted Judaism about 740 A.D. as a defensive measure, hoping it would neutralize them from Christian pressures from the north and west, as well as Muslim antagonism from the east and the south. So he's saying that these people in Khazaria, the Khazars, or Khazars, adopted Judaism about 740 A.D. as a defensive measure, trying to keep the Christians and the Muslims off their backs. It didn't, however, work, and they largely migrated westward into Europe, losing their national identity as Khazars, but retaining a religious one, not really their own. As the Jewish Encyclopedia stated over 50 years ago, 95% of the Jewish people don't have a drop of the blood of Israel in their veins. As recently as 100 years ago, there was still considerable antipathy on the part of Sephardic Jews, descendants of the real Judeans, against the Ashkenazic interlopers, descendants of the Khazars. Interesting uh, history, uh, very tightly encapsulated there. Uh, what do you think of it? Okay, I've researched that somewhat, and I use my old Encyclopedia Britannica of 1903 that's on the Pope's Holy Office of the Inquisition's list of forbidden books. Is it really? Absolutely. That's why they've completely revamped the whole Encyclopedia Britannica for the last 70 years. If you get the old edition, and it's published at the turn of the century, they have 25 pages on the Jesuit order. Wow. In there, if you look up Khazaria, you will find that there were many Jews who lived in Khazaria. Khazaria was a Gentile nation composed of white Gentiles, and there were also black Gentiles there. Hmm. There were also Jews there who conducted commerce. And they did not race mix. Although the king of Khazaria did adopt Judaism, not necessarily all the people did. You will not find that in this Britannica edition. And by the way, this Britannica edition of 1903 was published prior to this particular dogma being espoused by an Austrian in the, oh, like around 1910, 1920. Prior to this, there was no such argument as the Jews being uh, what are now the Turks and Khazars. It was unheard of. And furthermore, um, as far as the Ashkenazis are concerned and the Sephardic, uh, they, I'm sure there is intermixing there and race mixing, 
but 80 to 90 percent of who we see to the, who call themselves the Jews today are in fact the Jews, and I'll tell you why. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and he's about ready to set up the Davidic kingdom on earth after the seven-year tribulation, he will judge the Gentile nations that have survived on the basis of how they treated his brethren, the Jewish people. The Hebrew, God calls them Hebrew, men calls them Jews, how they have treated his brethren. The ones that have blessed them and helped them during the tribulation, they will enter into that kingdom. The ones that haven't will be killed. And that's in Matthew 25. For that to happen, Gentile nations have to know who the Jewish people are. Mm -hmm. So it's no mystery who the Jews are. The Jews know who they are, and the Gentile nations know who they are. And that's why they're always persecuted by race, not by religion per se. Another note from uh, Mr. Taft's email, he says, let me find this. Ah, he says, I recall a TV interview a few years ago of the recently deceased, much-loved comedian Milton Berle telling of his early life in New York City. He mentioned that his Sephardic father had married his Ashkenazic mother, much to the horror of his own people, and was financially ruined and socially ostracized for making such a statement, or actually for doing that, for marrying an Ashkenazic Jew, uh, his mother. So I don't know. I'm sure there's divisions among the Jewish people. There's no doubt. And there are also, they have Jews with lots of Gentile blood in them. It doesn't but, really matter, but, does it? But, no, does because it really make any difference? The important thing is, if we start deciding who's a Jew and who's not a Jew, That's and therefore the we decide all the people who call themselves Jews are not Jews in New York City, they're not Jews, then we can persecute them. And if we persecute the Jewish race, we're going to see the end of our country, just like Germany. Okay, we'll pause and come right back with Eric John Phelps. In fact, such controversial information that you'd like to call in and uh, agree or disagree, that's fine. 800-876-4123. 800-876-4123. Another very unusual program for you. And we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Uh, lots of email, lots of telephone calls. We'll get to those now. Let's take this email first. Dear Jeff, uh, this is from Howard. Thank you, Howard. Could your guests comment on Henry Ford's The International Jew series? First of all, let's take that part. What about uh, Ford's infamous book? I don't think Henry Ford had the capacity to write that three-volume set. Uh, Henry Ford uh, probably had a ghostwriter, just like Hoover had a ghostwriter for his Masters of Deceit mm -hmm. and his communist a bit, but nonetheless... He put his name on it, so... He put his name on it, so we'll assume that he wrote it. Uh, Henry Ford was a, he hated the Jewish people, he hated the Jewish race, he financed Adolf Hitler, and he brought, helped to bring forts and tractors into Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution. And, uh, so H Henry Ford was a, was a very much biased against the Jewish people, and I say he was an agent of the Jesuits. His son joined the Catholic Church and married into the McDonald family of McDonald Douglas notoriety. Um, he was just another papal agent. All right. Uh, how about... Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush, the same way. Prescott Bush Sr., you mean, or yeah, yeah, the senior. brother of George? No. Prescott Sr. Sr. was uh, one of the founders of the CFR. He was also, I believe, a knight of Malta. And you have a strong tie with the Bush family, with the Melodies. The Melodies are also the knights of Malta. So Prescott, well, Prescott Bush was uh, also censured twice by the government and ordered to stop trading with the enemy during the war. And that was just a hoax, because if they really wanted to do that, they would have tried him for treason and executed him. It was just for public consumption. Yeah, it was, it was consumed. Okay. Uh, the protocols, the famous, the famous protocols of the elders of Zion. The real, real or fiction? Real. Protocols, is, they're, they're not a forgery as far as its contents. Everything okay. that's in the protocols are true. That's happened. Okay. But the men who wrote the protocols, according to uh, uh, Leo Lehman, who was an Irish priest who later was converted to the Christ of the Bible, who, while he was a priest, conducted a trial in the Pope's sacred rota on behalf of American bishops and priests against the Jesuits. So Leo Lehman came out in his great book, Behind the Dictators, that he published in 1942, and said that the Jesuits wrote the protocols, and they were modeled after a previous book that the Jesuits had written called The, the Secrets of the Elders of Borgfontein, which was a book written against Jansenism. Huh. So the Jesuits wrote the protocols. Boy, there's been a big effort 
out there to discredit the book as a hoax, uh, as you well know, for years. But you're saying that the protocols uh, are, in fact, a legitimate piece of writing. As I read them, everything that's in there has happened. Okay. All and right. so, and they, their they, life elsewhere in the universe? Yes, I did. Strange. Uh, interesting question yes, to it, drop right in there. But, yes, it is. Let's hope there is. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and at the, the, the protocols was, re, was written at the time of the Dreyfus Affair, according to Leo Lehman. Oh, all right. So those who would uh, say that protocols are a hoax would have a real argument with Eric John Phelps. Okay. Well, I would never attribute them to the Jewish people. I understand, but that, but the point is that the basic mechanics and the data contained therein, in your estimation, is 100% legit. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, did Henry Ford ever apologize for the International Jew Series? Yes, he did. Uh, I had that story up on my website, in fact, at one point. It was a, kind of a, a hedging apology, but he did make a, a, at least a quasi-attempt to do so. That's interesting. No, it isn't. Perhaps... Uh, Let's see here. Also, what about your evaluation of Michael A. Hoffman's extensive research? Anything to say about uh, Michael Hoffman's work? I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Michael Hoffman has been on this program in the past. You can hear that in the archives as well. Okay. Let's go sure. to the uh, telephone. And first up tonight, Carolyn in Ogden, Utah. Hello, Carolyn. Thanks for calling in. What is your question for Eric? Yes, I have just three short questions. All right, let's take them one at a time. Okay, one. Are the Jews a race of people or a religion? All right. First and foremost, a race. The Bible talks about the sons of Jacob. In Malachi, the Lord says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, the sons of Jacob are not consumed. It's first and foremost a race. Then it's secondarily they have a religion. Okay. And the second question is, how does the other religions fit in with the Jesuits? All right. The other Protestant religions? or Yes. Well, the well, Jesuits, Jesuits, remember, are the soldiers of the Church of Rome, so you're talking about the non-Catholic religions, I would assume. Yes. All right. Well, the Jesuits control, for example, Lutheranism through Freemasonry. They control uh, Presbyterianism through Freemasonry. Anything that has a centralized church government is ultimately controlled by the order through Freemasonry. Uh, they control the Noonies. They control. Uh, they're controlling now the Southern Baptist Convention with 500,000 Freemasons in that uh, denomination. So they control all the Protestant denominations now, for the most part, through high-level Freemasonry. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's like Question. they control the Nation of Islam. And the last, number three. And the last one is: Is the LDS Church part of the Jesuits? Are That's they controlled? Correct. Yes. The Mormon Church was started by a Freemason named Joseph Smith, and then ultimately led by Brigham Young, who was another Freemason. And Brigham Young was a personal friend of the most powerful Jesuit in America in the 19th century, whose name was Peter de Schmidt, who led the great wars against the Indians, the wars of the Great Plains and the Indians. He was, uh, he was rather a butcher, according to some historians. Absolutely. Well, de, Sch de Schmidt, he controlled Philip Sheridan. Philip Sheridan was a Roman yeah. Catholic general who was the head of the U.S. Army, and he ignited the uh, the Indian Wars of the Great Plains mm -hmm. in 1868. Mm -hmm. All right, Carol, I hope that answers your questions. Now, just one more comment. So then the Mormon Church is tried in with the Freemasonry big time. Absolutely. If you check with the holy underwear, uh -huh. the holy underwear is the compass in the square. Mm -hmm. okay. go, go back and do that again, uh, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, give me that. Uh, for, it might have gone by too quickly for some people. Okay, Joseph Smith was a Freemason. Brigham Young was a Freemason. The temple, the Mormon temple, is patterned after Solomon's temple. In fact, that was a dry run for the rebuilding of the one in Jerusalem. The, the whole genealogical record-keeping is done to keep track of where the Jews are. And uh, so then the, uh, and de Schmidt, Peter de Schmidt was a personal friend of Brigham Young. And Brigham Young hired the Peyote Indians to massacre Protestant settlers that were coming out west. And you can find that in uh, the Godmakers. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, thank you, Jeff. You bet. Stand by, folks. We'll take a break. Uh, again, uh, controversial to say the least. And we shall continue with Eric John Phelps after this. Okay, right back with Eric John Phelps. Let's go back to the telephones and say hello to George in Salt Lake City. Hi, George. What's your question for Eric? 
Yeah, good evening, uh, Jeff Rands. Good evening, sir. Greetings to you. And to you. Uh, do you recognize my voice, sir? You've been on before, and you had a, a remarkable bit of information to contribute last time. I do remember it. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, your guest, sir, regarding your guest. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. <clears throat> Of course, I have to disagree with uh, some of his claims regarding the Khazar Empire and how they became Judaized and the reason. Of course, you know, uh, the reason was, uh, as uh, the gentleman has described on that page that you have uh, re uh, uh, read. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but uh, my comments really, you know, uh, regarding the Khazar Empire and the Khazars, yes, 95% I have been claiming to be a, well, it's closer than that. Ninety-eight percent of those Jews today that claims to be the seeds of Abraham, they are truly not. They are of, of Khazar uh, racial origin. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, the reason I claim this is I am Hungarian by birth, and there was a Jew, hung, a Jewish man, a very bright man, a great writer, excellent historian, by the name of Arthur Kosler. Have you heard? Sure. And he wrote a book uh, which was rather controversial, of course, very explosive because of his content, you know, The Thirteen Tribe. What he yeah. describes, the players uh, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea north of the uh, Caucasian Mountains. And so, and, and the Hungarians were, were well, um, uh, they were willing to play the game. They were subservient to the Khazars. The Hungarians, the Magyars, that is, our, you know, a tribe, a Magyar tribe, that we were, we, we were actually put in charge of, of collecting taxes for the Khazar Empire, for King Bulan and, and, uh, and the succeeding kings. And uh, the, the Khazars, you know, were so uh, powerful in those days, you know, the 8th, 9th century, that actually they have managed to collect uh, taxes, uh, uh, you know, from about 25 uh, Slavic tribes, you know, around the region. Okay. What I'm really claiming here, sir, is that I happen to know history, that part of history, and nobody can refute that, what I know. All us Hungarians, educated Hungarians, know our history. We know who these Khazars are. All right, let's get a comment. Bolshevik, sir, yes. Yeah, let's get a comment from Eric right now. Hold on right there, George, please. Go ahead, Eric. You know, what you're saying then, George, is that <clears throat> there existed the Jews who were the descendants of Abraham. And then all of a sudden, during their great diaspora, some epic event takes place where now these Jews who had the Torah, they had circumcision, they had kosher meals, they had a whole culture, they had synagogues, all of a sudden now they are displaced by some epic event by Gentiles who then adopt their religion, claim to be Jews, and these Jews who are originally Jews, they just forget their Jews, and they are no longer identify themselves as a Jewish culture anymore. My question to that whole theory is what epic event automatically ended the Jewish people of being truly the Jewish people, and now these Gentiles have taken their place? The, uh, the advent and the rise of the great and young uh, dynamic Christian uh, 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 nation, uh, uh, Kiev in Ukraine, a prince led by the prince uh, Svetoslav, he was the reason why the Khazars had to make a decision. The king, uh, the prince Svetoslav warned them to adopt a more civilized way of life. Uh, their manners, you know, regarding sex, you know, their sexual habits and so forth were so atrocious that the Russians, you know, could not put up with it, having such neighbors, you know, uh, on their southern borders. And so uh, King Bula knew that, uh, that uh, the Russian prince Svetoslav, you know, had the power also, not just the mouth. And so he summoned uh, leaders or representatives of the three major religions, sir, and they happened to uh, like and fancy, you know, the uh, Babylonian Talmud. Because the Babylonian Talmud, by its content, and, uh, has uh, very fitted very well, you know, the temperament, uh, the culture, and the, and the characteristics of this race. Okay, stand by, George. And uh, Eric, we're getting a little, a little less esoteric here, but uh, I'll let you answer that. Then we have to uh, get one final comment from George. I would have to say that even though King Bolin did adopt Judaism, which is validated in my resource research. Uh, there is no epic event that displaced the historic Jewish people from being who they were 
and being substituted for this Gentile race of Khazars. There is no historical event for that. Okay, we'll have to agree to disagree on this, George. One final comment from you, sir. Thank you, sir. Jeff Rez, I just, uh, I, I, I cannot tell you how much uh, I admire the depth of your intellect, sir. Well, thank you. It's thank amazing you. The, how you cover the entire spectrum, sir, uh, from the frivolous, you know, to the, the great depths of, uh, of, 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 of incredible. Well, it's it, absolutely it, but, fantastic. But my uh, comment, my final comment, sure. Henry Ford, I, we never claim that Henry Ford alone has written, you know, the three volumes, you know, International Jew. Henry Ford, someone, you know, some of his brightest, finest, brightest people, and he sent them out throughout the world. He told them, do not come back till you have a full picture of and the scope of the involvement of the Jewish Zionist uh, conspiracy on, on, on a global scale. They went out, including they went into Soviet Union. They came, they returned, and they published a book, the International Jew. Mm -hmm. uh, the book, you know, was periodically, weekly, you know, was actually being uh, 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 printed, you know, in the Dearborn Independent. Do you remember that, Jeffrey? Yeah, I have uh, seen mention of that, that it was yes, serialized But it was uh, not his report, not at all. It was his brilliant young people that worked in his empire, in mm -hmm. his corporation, mm -hmm. well, in his, in, in his uh, company. Uh -huh. And, of course, you know, the reason he was caused, you know, really, you know, to go uh, and uh, investigate, you know, the uh, activities of the international uh, Jewish uh, uh, finances mm -hmm. is because, actually, he was convinced that they were trying to take over his business. Mm. Well, his and that was the very reason. No, just... I really thank you very much, Jeff Rens. Thanks, George. Thanks for being out there, and thanks for participating. And, again, thanks for the very nice compliment. I appreciate it. Uh, Henry Ford's book, or whoever wrote the book for Ford, did profile, talk about profiling, uh, an MO, uh, a character, uh, a way of doing business, a way of approaching people in business, which a lot of people say is not an inaccurate portrayal. And so what? How do you see that? Well, I see, I mean, as far as the way the Jews do business? Yeah. As um, far as Ford's perception of them, paranoid as it may have been, uh, the profile that he presented in the book has been talked about by a lot of people for decades as being reasonably ac accurate of a certain portion, at least, of the Zionist movement. Well, I'm sure there's lots of truth with regard to the Zionist movement that is in the international Jew. My objection to the work is there's not one mention of the Jesuit order and their influence, in fact, their origination of the whole Zionist movement and its relationship to the papacy. It's always an attack against the Zionist Jews, and there are plenty of them in the Council on Foreign Relations, sure. but there's never the connection made to the Knights of Malta, like William F. Buckley, like Alexander Haig, like George Tennant, and others. And also, there's never a connection made to the Jesuit order, like presider, CFR presider, Joseph O'Hare, president of Fordham University. So you would suggest that uh, Henry Ford and his men missed the forest because of the trees? I would say that they were very much motivated and, and uh, part of the Jesuit conspiracy, working for the Jesuit order, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, fascinating to look at all of this uh, through the eyes and mind of our callers and my guest tonight, Eric John Phelps. His book, The Vatican Assassins, which uh, details all of his work, uh, is out there and available. All you have to do is call for it. Give us the number one more time. It's 1-877-280-2866. Uh, That's 1-877-280-2866, Wisdom Books and Press, California Hours from 9 to 5. Okay. If you're on the East Coast, make it early. That's uh, Pacific Coast time. Malachi Martin, very famous on uh, late night talk radio, uh, a lot of interesting things to say. What's your opinion of his work? The late Malachi, Mar on. Malachi Martin, in my estimation, was a liar. Malachi Martin, in, in his works, uh, attempted to portray three great powers vying for world hegemony. That is the papacy, the United States, and Russia. That's all a lie. The papacy has been controlled by the Jesuit general since 1814. The United States has been controlled by the Jesuit general no later than 1868 with the 14th Amendment. 
and Russia has been controlled by the Jesuit general no later than 1922 when Joseph Stalin was named Secretary of the Communist Party. The Jesuits control all three factions, and Malachi Martin was in a position of intelligence to know that. So he was doing disinformation or what? Yes, he was. Absolutely. Some of his material had to be accurate, or people wouldn't pay any attention to it. That's the way, if in fact he was doing disinformation, and I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with you, but disinformation is always predicated on a lot of good information. Came the illusion of the Cold War? Yeah. Okay, all right, lots to think about here. Uh, we'll pause. Uh, you call us online. Hang on. 800-876-4123. If you'd like to call in and participate, you're welcome to. Or you can drop me an email. I'll try and get to that as well. Just to jradrents.com, and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. Take it easy for a few, and we'll be right back. And right back with Eric John Phelps, whose book, Vatican Assassins, is a, uh, a real talk of the town item. 877-280-2866, if you want to buy a copy of it, 877-280-2866. Phone callers, uh, go ahead, Eric. Maybe Santa Clara, Jeff. I'm sorry, what did I say? Santa Rosa. Let's see, our next call is from Santa Rosa. And let's do that right now if we can. Uh, it is Santa Clara, California. In Santa Rosa is Brian standing by. Hello, Brian. Welcome to the program. Hello, guys. Hi. I'm on being there at Santa Clara, by the way. Great. Good. Nice to meet you. Yep. Uh, well, guys, the, re I, I, the reason uh, why I called is because of drugs. Um, uh, and not, I'm not really thinking about the hardcore, like crack, heroin, the ones that kill you. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about the natural ones like uh, mushrooms, like animated mascara and cannabis, hemp, and or otherwise known as marijuana. Okay. What's the direct question with that? Okay. Well, the question is, because we know that the, the latter of the two, the natural ones, the herbal ones, they don't, people don't OD off those. Uh, no, they, I, those, don't, those don't kill you. Well, the okay. point is, uh, you know how these Jesuits have so much control, and it seems like if they would want us to have it, we would have it, and I want to know why they keep it away from us. What do All they right. know? Why, what's the Jesuit connection to the international drug trade and the trade here in the United States in terms of keeping the so-called lower-level drugs out of the hands of uh Legality. Excellent question. The Jesuit general controls the international drug trade through his international intelligence community. The Central Intelligence Agency works together with the mafia in distributing the drugs. With regard to hemp, it is, it is a policy that whenever this country enters into a treaty with another country, that country, if it grows hemp, will not grow hemp any longer. Because hemp, in the words of Jefferson, he said America will be great because America is rich in hemp. Hmm. Hemp is for rope, clothing, uh, wood. We could build all of our homes out of hemp. We wouldn't need to chop down our forests. Uh, hemp is a, is a crop that can be grown without any pesticides or herbicides. It's a hemp super is, plant, isn't it? It's a something. super plant, and we have every right to it. And the other thing is we have not been allowed to have painkillers. Every time we're in terrible pain, we have to go to what I call in my book in Chapter 49, the Holy Office of the Inquisition, which is, which is the Food and Drug Administration and the American Medical Association, and they are the only ones who have access to the opiates or the painkillers, when we should have access to them as well. So they keep the painkillers away from us to make sure we go to the Holy Office of the Inquisition. They run the international drug trade and make that available on the street. It's a continual weakening and sickening of the American people. Boy, it's amazing how uh, entire populations are held hostage over their pain. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, talk about hunger getting people to respond. Pain will probably get them to respond even quicker. Sure, sure. Yep, and they go right down to the dock and they uh, pay the money and they get the prescription. They head to the pharmacy and they pick it up. And uh, it, it would seem that by birthright we have uh, <clears throat> a legal right to the reduction of personal pain and suffering. Absolutely. We have a right yeah. to the herbal opiates that can reduce our pain. Okay, excellent question. As far as the mushrooms are concerned, a lot of people go out and uh, partake. They are uh, on God's green earth, as it is said, and uh, totally natural, as are other things. We've done many programs on them in the past. All right, good question. Thank you for that, Brian. And uh, Conspiracy Conference, May 25 and 26, Brian will be there and probably come up and say hello to you, Eric, which it's will be very good. My pleasure to talk with you. Okay, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Steve is up next with a question. Hello, Steve. 
Yeah, hi, Jeff. Hi. And Eric. Um, boy, thank you for having him on for all three hours, Jeff. We should have him on for a few more times. But he's, a, he's an amazing reservoir of, uh, of knowledge and information. Yeah, that is definitely true. I got his book, and it's like a phone book. But uh, anyway, um, I had three questions. I thought up a couple others over the, uh, while I was on hold. But the first one is, uh, Eric, you mentioned the, uh, the previous time that you were on Jeff's program that um, I believe the Islamic uh, religious leaders are they're called muftis. Is that right? M U F T I muftis. Yeah. Muftis. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that they were Masons, and that, I mean that's a blockbuster statement. How are you able to uh, determine that? Well, I have a source to prove it, but I try to keep it quiet. But if you look at the symbolism of Freemasonry, especially in the Mystic Shrine, what do you see? All those Shriners wear fezes. <laughs> sure the caps called fezes. Right. That, that's an Islamic dress. Mm. By the way, the Pope's Zouave army in the days of John Stuart and even now, they also wear fezes. If you look at the symbol, again, of the uh, Shriner Freemasons, they use a crescent. Yeah. That's Islamic. And the swords? Uh, and, the, and the scimitar, that's the right. Scimitars, yeah. That's also Islamic. You mentioned right. something interesting, uh, the Zouaves. Uh, it, it's... I've seen old television uh, videotapes, and I, they used to have the Zouaves would actually, actually participate in parades here. Right. And get all dressed up in their Arabic uh, right. garb and march. Boy, it, it was quite a colorful thing, I guess. Right. But they sort of uh, faded into the background. But the Zouaves, Z-O-U-V-E-S, I think. The Z-O-A-U-V-E-S. Z-O-A, that's right. Interesting, uh, the Pope's private army, as it were. That's right. In fact, when John Stuart escaped from the United States with the help of the papacy, he enlisted in the Pope's Suave Army hmm. and was stationed in Alexandria, Egypt, when he was arrested by uh, the U.S. and brought back to the United States for trial in 1867. I have, a picture of, I have a picture of Surat in my book in his Suave uniform. Amazing. All right. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Another oh. question. Well, actually, uh, do the Muftis have to be a, uh, do they have to be 32nd or 33rd degrees to, they, to be a Mufti? Even more than that, are they all Masonic or just the key yeah. Mufti Ayatollahs? Yeah. The key Mufti Ayatollahs are Masonic. The major players in the Middle East right now are the Saud dynasty, the Hussein dynasty, and the Hussein dynasty also includes Yasser Arafat because his uncle was... I mean, El Hussein, Husseini, I believe that's the full name, who was uh, the Mufti of Jerusalem, a Freemason appointed to his post by another brother Freemason who was a Masonic Jewish Zionist, the first High Commissioner of Palestine, Herbert Samuel. Uh, by the way, Yasser Arafat's name is not Yasser Arafat. He has, a, he has another, his, his original name is much different than that. I had it the other day, I don't have it at my fingertips, but uh, that's an assumed name. And just like the Bush family is Masonic, so you have all these players now tied together through high-level Freemasonry, ultimately controlled by the Jesuit order because the Jesuits wrote the first 25 degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. They merged it all together with the Council of Wilhelmsbad in 1782 and have controlled it in this country since 1801. Vladimir Putin? I don't know much about him, but I'm sure he's Jesuit controlled because every, every uh, premier of Russia has been since then. Premier Zhang Zemin? Same way. The Jesuits caused the, the uh, Chinese... After the Jesuits overthrew the Manchu dynasty in 1912, they were in control of Chiang Kai-shek and, and orchestrated his defeat so that Mao Zedong could come to power in 1949. So they are absolutely trained now. I don't know for him. Wow. Uh, butchery and slaughtery uh, doesn't stop them for... 50 million Chinese. Yeah, at least... Okay, uh, go ahead, Steve. Okay. Um, the third temple that's going to be built, will that actually build, be built by the Zionists then? The third I think temple so. over in Jerusalem? I think, I think it will be built by the Zionists there with the help of their, their high rabbis, but it will be under UN protection. Okay, and then are, oh, are you familiar with the Temple Mount Foundation? No, I'm not. Okay. All right, and then the third question. Um, are you familiar with the Committee of 300? Yes. How, how are they tied in with the Jesuits? It's all Masonic or Knights of Malta, and they're, they're the Jesuits' bankers. Okay, so let's see, run that by again. They're all... Either... They're all Masonic, high-level Freemasons, or, and or Knights of Malta, like Prince Bonhart of Holland, who was a Knight of Malta and a Nazi in the founder of the Bilderbergers. 
and they are nothing more than the Vatican bankers, along with the House of Rothschild and the Sassoon House of England. But they're there. It's a real group. There are three, about 300 of them, give or take, and, uh, and they just carry out the business for the Vatican. That's the yeah. That's the uh, financial enforcement arm, as it were. One of the keys to understanding that is the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon was the hammer of the Jesuit order to punish the Roman Catholic monarchs of Europe for expelling them from their countries, Spain, France, Italy, Austria, and so on. Napoleon was a Roman Catholic Freemason. His second council on the consulate was Abbe Emmanuel Saez, who was Jesuit-trained and a temple coadjutor. And Napoleon was financed by, guess who, the House of Rothschild. So the House of Rothschild financed everything the Jesuits wanted to do through their Corsican Robespierre on a horseback, Napoleon Bonaparte. Robespierre on a horseback. That's right. That's what Madame de called him. <laughs> Interesting. 800-876-4123, and we'll take one more question from Steve if he has it after the break. I am Jeff Rents, and glad you're here with Eric John Phillips. Okay, we're back. And let's get a final comment from Steve in Colorado Springs for Eric John Phelps. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that it's important to distinguish uh, between Christianity and Catholicism. Uh, the Crusades are a perfect, perfect example. Uh, Jesus never told us to go and kill people who don't accept him as their savior. We're just simply to present the information and uh, let them make up their mind. But I'm not, and I'm not anti-Catholic people, but I'm definitely anti-Catholic doctrine because the Catholic uh, Church's doctrine is a false doctrine. And if people will study that, uh, they will find that they do not need the Roman Catholic Church or any Catholic Church or any church, actually, for their salvation. It's strictly through Jesus' shed blood on the cross. That's, that's just the final comment I'm going to make. Okay. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, thanks. Indeed. Uh, Eric, anything to add to that? I think he's absolutely right. <laughs> I'm not anti-Catholic people. I'm anti-Catholic doctrine, or actually Jesuit doctrine, because they control the doctrines, and anti the Jesuit deeds that they have done. And furthermore, the essence of Roman Catholicism is nothing more than Greco-Roman paganism that's been Christianized with Christian names. And that's amply proven by Alexander Hislop's work, The Two Babylons, Charles Chinequy's work, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. It can be easily proven, so it's not fair to say that that's Christianity, that's Romanism. It was called Romanism all throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And to, in this century, the Jesuits have sought to merge Protestantism and Catholicism and call it all Christianity. And that's not fair or correct. No, it doesn't sound correct at all. Because in Protestant nations, in white Protestant nations, where the Reformation prospered, they never persecuted the Jewish race. In Catholic nations, they always did. Ah. Okay. That's an important point to distinguish. Yeah, the United so. States has never had a formal Jewish persecution in 200 years. And Germany was uh, it was, largely it was, Catholic. It was Protestant, but Bavaria was the Catholic. Remember, the two major Jesuit Catholic strongholds in Europe are Ireland and Bavaria. Oh, okay. And out of Bavaria, they brought their Third Reich. That's where the Tool Society began that the Jesuits controlled. And so that's when they took control of the German government. All the high Nazis were Roman Catholic. Bormann, after he escaped to South America, became a lay brother in the Redemptorist Order. His son became a Jesuit. They were all tied in together with the order. So when the Roman Catholic Bavarians took over Germany, they then persecuted the Jews with the German people. Did Hitler die in the bunker, or was that his double? That was his double. Hitler escaped along with Mengel, Bormann, Eichmann. Which is, brings up another question. Why did the Jesuits allow the Mossad to capture Eichmann and bring him back to Jerusalem in 1960? That is an interesting question. Very good question. But all the high Nazis uh, escaped to South America except Heinrich Himmler. You know why he died? He took his whole family out with him. Well, Himmler, Himmler was brought to power by the Jesuit order through his father and his uncle. Mm -hmm. but Himmler did not know Russia was controlled by the Jesuits. He thought Russia was controlled by the Jews, the Jewish Bolshevik, an international Jewish conspiracy, quote-unquote. Hmm. So Himmler, towards the end of the Reich, he goes to a prince, I believe, of Sweden and tries to negotiate an attack against Russia. For that, Hitler stripped him of all of his powers, hmm. ordered him to be shot. Mm -hmm. So Himmler, unfortunately, jumps out of the frying pan into the fire and escapes to England into the hands of the British Secret Service, and of course that was the end of him, because the British Secret Service worked with SS 
so much less and so on. But Himmler made the same fatal mistake that Patton made. They both wanted to attack Russia, and Russia was to win in World War II because that would be the center of the Cold War and the birth of international terrorism. Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess was was deliberately sent to England and imprisoned for the reason that his replacement was Martin Bormann. Hmm. Martin Bormann became the secretary. He took his orders directly from the Jesuits who ran the SD, and mm-hmm. Bormann then mm-hmm. uh, escaped to South America with the rest. There were uh, <clears throat> a number of U-boats that went, of course, to Argentina and other points in South America. And I remember the one story of, I can't remember which U-boat it was, but it showed up, uh, pulled into port, empty except for a very small crew, and quite clearly it had a, a great deal of cargo in it, but uh-huh. nobody there. Yes, yes, they had lots of cargo, and one of their major cargoes was priceless art treasures. They brought many of Europe's art treasures into South America. I had a, a very interesting email the, the other day, which I'll try and get to in a minute here. Okay, let's see. And the, man, the, and the man mm-hmm. who received those guys in Argentina was Knight of Malta, Juan Perón. Ah, okay. okay. Lawrence uh, Caples has a, an email question for you. Was Malachi Martin head of Vatican intelligence? <laughs> Malachi Martin was, I don't know if he was the head, but he was very much involved with it because he was involved with the Pope's Curia. He was one of the Pope's advisors. And if he was one of the Pope's advisors, you can bet he was close to the Jesuit general. Right. So he was definitely involved in intelligence, but he was a disinformation figure when he came out and went public. Was the Jesuit general at the recent Council of Bishops? I would imagine. All right. And welcome back. Jeff Rents with Eric John Phelps. And uh, lots of questions coming in here. This is from David Burroughs. Your guest, Mr. Phelps, seems to be fairly familiar with the Bible. However, as concerns the question of the legitimacy of the current controllers of Israel, there is perhaps a couple, there are perhaps a couple of references in the Bible. Revelations 2, 9 and Revelations 3, 9. Both are references to Jesus' knowledge of the false Jews that are, however, of the synagogue of Satan. This is not made up. Pull out your Bible and look it up. Hope this adds some food for thought. And that's from David Burroughs. All right, again, the quote, uh, both are references to Jesus' knowledge of the false Jews that are, however, of the synagogue of Satan. That's a quote. Eric? Yes. The Lord wasn't making mention that they were false Jews racially. They were false Jews spiritually. Spiritually. All right, I I get it. That's what he's talking about. Mm. Hmm. For example, the Babylonian Talmud says that Jesus Christ was a bastard and Mary was a whore. I don't think that's very nice. So I would have to consider the men who wrote that as Antichrist. But I do not condemn the Jewish people or the Torah mm-hmm. simply because of the Talmud or the Zohar mm-hmm. or the Kabbalah. Mm-hmm. Those three things have nothing to do with the Torah, the Jewish people, or Moses and the law that he gave. Is uh, the black pope a candidate for the Antichrist? In some people's estimations? No. The purpose for the Black Pope, and I believe the devil raised up the Jesuit order, was to protect the sacred office of the papacy because it is an unbroken chain of the the Pope or the papal Roman Caesar, is what I call him in my book, who will ultimately be killed, he will be resurrected, come back to life, he will destroy the Vatican, and then he will go down into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and demand to be worshipped as God for three and a half years or 42 months. And this is the time that the Bible describes in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, as a time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. World War Three, coming to a planet near us? Well, I think what we have going now is going to be a major shift in political powers, especially in the West, so we could very well probably call this a World War Three. But after this happens and the United States is reduced and occupied and the Islamic nations are reduced, um, Israel will be in a place to rebuild their temple. And that's exactly what the papacy is using as Masonic Jewish scientists for. The Israeli spy ring in the United States has been said to be the largest discovered organized espionage campaign in our history. Well, I don't think the Mossad is an enemy of the CIA. 
CIA, in fact, Reinhard Gellin, according to John Loftus in his great work, The Secret War Against the Jews, yeah. shows that in the early 50s, Reinhard Gellin was training the Mossad. Reinhard Gellin was Hitler's most sinister general mm. who was made a general in the American army by an act of Congress. Mm -hmm. So Gellin creates, he helps to create the CIA, and he also creates the Mossad. So the Mossad is an extension of the Black Folks Intelligence Agency. And another issue here, too. If the Mossad was really, truly pro-Israeli people, why haven't they killed Yasser Arafat? That's because, a question we've asked uh, on this program rhetorically a number of times. Yeah, because Yasser Arafat is the greatest traitor to Islam who probably ever lived. His purpose is, indeed he kills many Jewish people, which is a crime and a sin, but his purpose is to smoke out uh, Arab people, Arab leaders that will truly be against the Pope's Zionist government, these men commit their crimes against the Jewish people by mass murder, and then this gives the right to the Mossad to go out and kill them. He's a bird right? dog. He's a bird dog. That's all Yasser Arafat is. That's why he'll never be removed. And I have a picture on my webpage of Yasser Arafat, the Council on Foreign Relations, right along with Shimon Perez. What a scene. Yes. How long have you been at this, Eric? Your scholarship, your study, your research? About 20 years. <laughs> have you ever had this? Yeah, have you ever had to say, hey, I, I was wrong on that? And, and oh, yeah. Oh, sure. What was, the biggest thing, what was the biggest thing you were tripped up on? Anything in particular stand out? I couldn't make the connection between Freemasonry and the Vatican for quite a while. Mm. That was a problem. And I also couldn't make the, I could not distinguish between the Zionists and the Jewish people. Uh, well, most people can't. Yeah, see, that was a problem for a while until I realized that the Zionists were Masonic, the Jesuits controlled Freemasonry, and thus the Jesuits must control the Zionists, and thus the Mossad. Now I had the connection. Lights on. Yes. Bingo. In fact, when I was reading, when I was reading, uh, what's his name, Plausible Denial by, uh, what's his name? The Attorney. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm mm -hmm. uh, Mark Lane. To blank too. Mark Lane. Mark Lane. When I ran across that portion of his book where he talked about Rudolf Kastner, when he was being accused by a, by a poverty-stricken Jew there in Israel with his pamphlet 51, accusing Kastner of being a traitor, that he worked with Eichmann in deporting Jews to Auschwitz. When I read that, then I knew that Zionism was run by the Jesuits because it was working in conjunction with the SS. 800-876-4123. We've got one segment remaining with the uh, prodigiously remarkable Eric John Phelps, who will be at the Conspiracy Conference in Santa Clara, May 25 and May 26. And you can go to their website, take a look at all the information about the conference. A big name roster of people will be presenting there. ConspiracyCon.com is the website. And right back, Eric John Phelps. We had the Cold War for a long time, the threat of nuclear war, and there were several occasions, apparently, uh, during which the uh, actually exchange of nuclear weapons was, uh, was almost accomplished, as it were. We came close to some pretty bad times, but by and large, the Cold War was uh, a fraud and a hoax perpetrated on the peoples of the world. Uh, I'd like to hear Eric speak about that. Yes, the Cold War was planned uh, much earlier, probably at the turn of the century, it was planned by the Jesuit War. They planned to run their second 30 years' war from 1914 to 1945. Then with their nuclear war hoax, their airborne nuclear war hoax that they established in Hiroshima and Nagasaki because no bombs were dropped there that were nuclear. There were flash devices and the nuclear devices were on the ground. And when they created this nuclear war hoax... So, whoa, 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 whoa. A lot of people said, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. The Enola Gay did not drop the fat man or the big boy? The dropped two fat bombs? Big, yes, a uh, boxcar dropped uh, what big boy and Enola Gay dropped fat man, but they were yeah. not nuclear bombs. They were, um, flash, they were flash devices that signaled the Jesuits on the ground because Pedro Rupi was the rector of the novitiate at Yamaguchi, which was in between Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And there is where they assembled their nuclear devices on the ground because they had first detonated one of them in Tunguska in Siberia in 1908. Uh, so they, they, they went after... Uh, by the way, if that's true, if that's true, I, I, 
I believe it was an aerial object, but if that's true, that was one hell of a big blast for a first trial run, wasn't it? No, I mean, no. That was, a, <laughs> that was a big bomb. Which, which a first trial explosion. run? Tunguska. Tunguska, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, that wasn't just a little pop in the, uh, in no. the sandy uh, desert of New Mexico. No, that was, that was every, there's every indication there that was, could possibly even be a hydrogen bomb device. Well, it was certainly <laughs> big enough, although I, I, you know, I, I personally don't go along with that, but okay. keep going. Okay, um, so they created the Cold War on the basis of what I consider to be the airborne nuclear war hoax. I'm not saying that air nukes don't detonate. I'm saying that they cannot be launched and detonate in motion in the air with air bursts. I've so, read that, too, I, and I've read that, and that's a, it's, a, it's a provocative, although a very eclectic argument, but it's out there. Well, I have a Jesuit connection that pretty much validates that, that huh. the route they pulled it off. Huh. Um, okay, so now they have the basis for their Cold War, mutual assured destruction, but the irony is that the Jesuits control Dirty Harry Truman, who's a Schreiner Freemason, and they control Joseph Stalin. So... They give this device to both sides to create fear and terror among the people so that the United States government and military will not intervene with all this mass murder going on in Europe, in East Germany, and so on. So Stalin gets to kill the vast majority of Protestants in East, Eastern Europe. That is all of what was going on in East Germany, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, mm-hmm. primarily the Protestant Inquisition at the hands of Stalin. Mm-hmm. So when they finished up with their Cold War in 1989, they had killed the majority of the world's uh, uh, enemies against the papacy. Now all the dictators are either openly or convert, uh, covertly uh, subordinate to the Jesuit general. Mm-hmm. And now that they ended the Cold War, now they've started the war against uh, the Western Hemisphere using Islam. Because Islam is the sword of the church. If you evaluate Islam in the last hundred years, that every killing that they've ever been involved in has always benefited the Jesuit order. Look at the million or so Armenians that the Turkish Islamics murdered in what, 1898? No, no, it was 1912, 19, 1912? 1909, something. Okay. It was early in the 20th century that the Turks murdered a million Armenian Christians that were not subject to the Bishop of Rome. Mm-hmm. Uh, Islam it was... Uh, was busy uh, involved with the SS, with uh, the invasion of Barbaros. In fact, the Mufti of Jerusalem was over the head of that uh, legion that was with the SS. Huh. Well, it's interesting uh, to fast forward to Kosovo and Bosnia. Sure, same and thing. The conflict going on there does seem to mirror it all. The Jesuit general is using the American military to destroy the Orthodox Serbs. Painting them with a brush of crazy. Oh and boy, that, that, that was amazing. I, you gotta, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Milosevic, but he well, is he, uh, presenting he's an interesting. Yeah, he's presenting he's a, a pretty stout defense in in court and making some. <laughs> he's not getting the press, of course, but he's trying to tell it like uh, it happened to him. Mm-hmm. And and then you have the Albanian Muslims with their drug trade working in conjunction with the CIA, and they're also murdering Serbs in this very moment. Well, look what's happening in Afghanistan. From the all-time low opium crop of a year ago to a world record opium crop in, in one year, they're expecting. Right. Not, not a big surprise. Here's an interesting email I got. We talked about Adolf Hitler not dying in the bunker. That uh, it was his, He had at least one, de- pardon the pun, dead ringer double. Uh, except for the mole. The guy didn't have a mole. Now, here's the, I got an email the other day. This is interesting. I won't identify who sent it. It said, your article, I had a, a link up to a very lengthy article on Adolf Hitler uh, written by a Greek journalist. Very good. Uh, your article on Adolf Hitler not dying is correct. His granddaughter used to visit our home in California in 1989 and 90. They lived in Argentina. She lived in La Jolla. He did not die until around 1992-93. The photos of the alleged Adolf are simply rewriting history as alleged. Uh, then I asked for more information, and I got this back. Uh, her name was, uh, I'll leave that blank. She and her male friends had what was called uh, XX Industries. One gentleman's name was Robert, one was Mark, and the other was Kevin. Delightful young people. Sonia, a beautiful young lady. Um, she had long blonde hair. What was her name? Sonia. We put that out. 
blue eyes and sharp as a tack. Her height, about 5'7", slim. One time I overheard her talking to my late husband about her grandfather, Adolf, and she said there was one identifying mark that would separate him from the doppelgangers, and it was a mole on his face. The doppelgangers did not have this mole. Back in 1992, 93, somewhere in that time frame, one of the grocery store rag newspapers had a photo of the alleged body of Hitler who had recently passed away in Argentina. Sure enough, there was the mole. So, I, that sound viable to you? Absolutely. All the top Nazis that were obedient to the end got out. And they were, they were escorted out with the help of Bishop Houdal. They arranged for their Red Cross passports, and they, they went to South America, and many of them went into the North America. Uh, the Mueller, who was the head of the Gestapo, he came to the United States with the help of Cardinal Spellman and was an advisor for the CIA until he died in, what, in 73, 74? Well, there are, are more Nazis came to America than the average person who knows a little bit about it will ever understand. That's been the, Vatican, the Vatican secreted out of Europe 50,000 Nazis. Mm-hmm. to the Vatican Redlands. Well, they really were the agents of the Vatican, so Absolutely. they're taking care of their own, and why it shouldn't be a big surprise. Right, they were just taken, they were just fulfilling the Jesuits' Council of Trent. Here's a, a note for uh, for you from uh, Joseph Gates. Thank you, Joseph. Dear Jeff, thanks for the excellent program. Many times, uh, I'm reading this through first time, I applaud you for the courageous stand you take on some issues. However, lately, I find you somewhat critical of the Catholic Church and the things happening at its core. Definitely wrong, of course. The thing is, we have to understand where these things originate, and that takes lots of study. And he gives me an idea of uh, books to get. One booklet called The Human Genus. Are you familiar with that one? No, I'm not. Uh, uh, anyway, he goes on. The man who wrote it was Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Thirteenth. Jesuit trained Pope. The powers he is talking about have finally won the battle he was valiantly fighting. When you know that and who these powers are, you will realize that the Catholic Church itself is being held hostage. Then you will understand what is happening. Remember the country which has the most marvelous constitution is the U.S. How come it has the most evil government? Simply because the people who are holding America hostage are the same ones destroying the Church of Rome. When you learn all of this, you won't be so harsh when you refer to Catholicism. And I have not put down Catholicism as it's practiced by the masses at all. That's not been the issue. But thank you, Joseph, for that. You got a comment, Eric? Yes. The Jesuit order took over the papacy after it punished it, after it imprisoned Pope Pius VII for five years using Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1814, the Jesuit order was revived, and since that time, the Jesuit general has controlled the papacy. And the, and the Jesuits are the Pope's penholders. Everything that's happened has been under their guidance. And our country here, our Washington's Calvinistic Republic, was destroyed in 1868 with a forced ratification of the 14th Amendment, creating what my book calls a Holy Roman 14th Amendment American em- Empire, the monster of the 20th century, to restore the Pope's temple power around the world with all of our rulers. So the Jesuits have taken our country, and they've taken the papacy, and they've taken Russia, and they've taken China. They have it all. So we need to do exactly what the other nations of the 19th century did. They kicked them all out of Europe. Virtually every country in Europe, I believe, except Belgium, kicked the Jesuits out, and they came here into England. And the Pope, uh, in 1773, the great Pope Clement XIV, with his papal bull, Dominic Acredemptor Noster, suppressed and abolished the Jesuits forever, confiscated all their wealth and treasure, and abolished the order and forbade them to ever teach or preach again. So it's not like the papacy has not sought to resist the Jesuit order. Mm -hmm. Third secret of uh, Fatima? Fatima? The purpose of Fatima was to to incite the Catholic masses of Europe against communist Russia, which the Jesuits secretly ran for the purpose of converting communist Russia to Catholicism, which was the purpose of Operation Barbarossa. Third secret? Is there one? I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay. Eric, thank you. A prodigious presentation. My pleasure, and you had a wonderful audience, and it was my pleasure to speak with you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk again. Uh, you know, I'd like to, if you would, get a chance from time to time, just keep me updated on your views of what's happening, and we'll okay. see if, uh, if your research pans out. 25 and 26th of May this month, Santa Clara, California. 
conspiracycon.com for all the details. And you can get the book. Get the book. 877-280-2866. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jim. And thank you. And we'll all talk soon. Take care. 